We'll just wait just a couple minutes, see if anybody else logs on, and then we'll get started right away. Can you guys hear me? Here we go. We're coming in now. Loud and clear. All right, perfect. Hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, Patty. Hello. So I was just invited to be a keynote speaker at the AGLA trade show seminar. So I will see you guys in October if you're going to the AGLA event. Um, I think I'm speaking at the AACSC trade show also. And yeah, <laughs> I got a lot of things happening in the month of October. It's going to sneak up on me quickly. Um, I'm still getting a lot of questions in regards to LA counties. Uh, um, <laughs> LARSO invading unincorporated cities. So remember, if you're in an incorporated city, this doesn't apply to you. But if you're in one of the 144 unincorporated cities within LA County, you guys just got rent control through RSO. Um, and it's more than rent control. It is uh, mandatory relocation amounts in the event that you um, need to displace your tenants for more than 30 days. Um, they have a set fee schedule for what relocation amounts would be. They're not cheap. Um, and they have um, your temporary displaced tenants for your um, per diem per day, um, instead of it based on your monthly rent in uh, unincorporated cities of L LA County, you are mandatory to go by the county's relocation amounts per day and their per diem, which is $207 per day, uh, plus an additional $66 for each adult and $33 for each child that's 12 and under, and that's for meals and incidentals. So, sorry, I'm letting people in, you guys. No matter how much your rent is, the county of Los Angeles now tells you what your per diem amount is per day. So very important that you understand that. And I see we got more people coming in. I should always wait five minutes before I start yakking. Hi, Patty. I'm just checking when we can schedule a call. I did send you the requested info. You got it, Arlene. Um, why don't you call me tonight about 6.30ish? And you sent me an email with the two documents I asked for. It was the rental agreement and something else. Don't remember what it was, but if, as long as I got those two documents, we're good, okay? <laughs> then I can answer thank your- you, Thank you, Patty. No worries. I'll, call, I'll call you tonight. Okay, yeah, thanks. 637 works good for me. Because I'm, okay, I'm out of the office by then and commuting. There okay. was an Agla Zoom meeting. There was an Agla Zoom meeting. <laughs> Oh, in regards to the County of Los Angeles information that I'm trying to give you guys, it's just important, you guys, we gotta register our units in the county by September 30th. Um, it's $30 for just cause only units and $90 for fully covered at fault units. Um, and it's per unit. So if you have an apartment community, it's per door. Okay, I did find that out from the county. Um, so those of us in the county, in these cities that have rather large apartment communities, we have to pay um, the $33 or the $30 or the $90, depending on um, how our property is affected by the bureaucracy. I don't know. We couldn't get it yesterday at all. He said that we have to warm up the before we I tried. I tried. I could, it wouldn't, it wouldn't open. Everybody has your mic open and your so if you could mute yourself. Thank you. That would be greatly appreciated. Sorry, I missed that about the $30. Got a lot of noises going on. Gotcha. No problem. So Los Angeles County Consumer and Business Affairs, Housing and Tenant Protections, for unincorporated cities in LA County, you're now governed by the county. 
So if you're in an unincorporated city in LA County, and mind you, there is 144 of them, I'd show you on a piece of paper, but my background doesn't always let me show you guys. So there's 144 cities in LA County that are unincorporated. Um, and I always use this one as an example. The city of Whittier is incorporated, but East Whittier, West Whittier, North Whittier, and South Whittier are unincorporated. So they have just adopted the same type of rent control, relocation fees, annual pay to be registered in their program as the city of Los Angeles, okay? You have to sign up if you're affected by this and you're in an unincorporated city of the county, you need to register your property uh, by September 30th. Registration is $90 per fully covered unit or space um, and $30 for just cause only units. Um, and you register on DCBA dot la county dot gov dot rent registry there's a lot of words there i know i'm sorry um and they have different amounts that we have to pay for relocation fees both for totally relocating a tenant or for temporary relocations due to a repair they have a set schedule of per diem that needs to be paid it's not one thirtieth of your rent in those cities it's $207 per night plus an additional $66 for each adult and $33 for each child 12 and under. So if you got the typical family, two adults and three kids, you're gonna have to pay them damn near over, it's just over $500 per night for each night you have to put them out for no hot water or whatever your issue may be. So that's for your temporary relocation fees you have to use the county's set schedule, okay? And you gotta register your units by September 30th. And from what I understand, I think they're gonna, I wanna say I saw something that said they were gonna waive the registration fees for the first year. But right now I don't see that. So I don't wanna repeat it and say something I shouldn't. Got it? <laughs> Trying. The check was cashed on 627. I needed to know this, you guys, sorry. I got that, I got that. And it was for Clara Walters. Got it. I'll take care of it as soon as I get out of here. Thank you. <laughs> I told her to do that in our meeting today. For the rest of you, pay no attention to it. It's just business. <laughs> All right. So um, was going to focus, refocus on the county and our units. If you're in an incorporated city of LA County, this does not apply to you. It's only the unincorporated cities in LA County. There's 144 of them. If you go on Google, you can type in list of unincorporated cities in LA County, and it will show you the list. I print it out. I now carry it with me everywhere. I don't have them memorized. Not going to happen. Blonde. Um, no, <laughs> that's too much for this brain. So take note um, that you do need to register on or before the end of September 30th. Yeah, next month, you guys, it's coming. Um, and we want to make sure that we get registered uh, quickly in the event that we do need to register in LA County. Um, and that was my concerns on LA County's rent registry for the new garbage that's being dumped on us. Does anybody else have anything that they wanna talk about, need to address, questions they need answered? Let's is, that the, is that the same thing as the rent registration that we've been paying per unit? Because I'm in Van Nuys, I've been paying that for years now. Are yeah. you talking about unincorporated? That's City of Van Nuys's um, own doing. Van Nuys, hold on, I'll look. Van Nuys is an incorporated city, so this doesn't apply to you if you're in Van Nuys. Yeah, but I've been paying the uh, paying the rent registration every year for RSO and all that. Yeah, so you're. You're into it through RSO, not through the new counties, unincorporated cities. I'm going to read these off to you guys really quickly, just so you know.
the unincorporated cities in LA County and who they affect so you know what we're talking about, okay? Here we go. Acton, Agora, Agora, or uh, I don't even, Agua Dulce? Don't ask. Alpine, Altadena, Antelope Acres, Athens or West Athens, Avocado Heights, Baldwin Hills, Bassett, Belvedere Gardens, Big Pines, Bouquet Canyon, Calabasas Highlands, Canyon Country, Castake, Castake Junction, City Terrace, Cornell, Crystal Air, Deer Lake Highlands, Del Air, Del Sur, East Los Angeles, East Pasadena, East Rancho Dominguez, East San Gabriel, East Whittier, Eastmont, El Camino Village, El Dorado, Elizabeth Lake, Fairmont, Fernwood, Firestone, Florence, Forest Park, Franklin Canyon, Glenview, Gorman, Graham, Green Valley, Hacienda Heights, High Vista, Juniper Hills, Cagle Canyon, Canola Mesa, La Crescenta, La Rambla, Ladera Heights, Lake Hughes, Lake Los Angeles, Lakeview, Lang, Las Vigrenes or Malibu Canyon, Lenox, Leona Valley, Little Rock. Well, I know LL means Y, but it's L-L-A-N-O, and I want to say Yano, but I don't think that's right. Longview, Los Cerritos Wetlands, Los Nitos, Malibu Lake, Malibu Bowl, Malibu Highlands, Malibu Vista, Malibu Sycamore Canyon, Marina Del Rey, Mint Canyon, Monte Nido, Montrose, Mulholland Colander, I'm sorry, Mulholland Corridor, I'll get it out, Nanach, Newhall, North Whittier, Northwest Whittier, Oat Mountain, Pear Blossom, plus Plus Sarita Canyon, I'm trying you guys, Quartz Hill, Rancho Dominguez, Redmond, Roosevelt, Roland Heights, San Clemente Island, San Pascal, Santa Catalina Island, Saugus, Seminole Hot Springs, Soledad, South San Gabriel, South San Jose Hills, South Whittier, Stevenson Ranch, Sulphur Springs, Sun Village, Sunset Mesa, Sunset, Sunshine Acres, Sylvia Park, Tree Points, Topanga, Topanga Canyon, Triunifo Canyon, don't know, sorry. Twin Lakes, Universal City, Valverde, Valencia, Valinda, Valermo, Vasquez Rocks, Vet Veterans Administration Center. I didn't know that that was a city, but I'm gonna have to check that out, okay? I'm marking that. View Park, Walnut Park, West Carson, West Chatsworth, West Puente Valley, West Rancho Dominguez or Victoria, West Whittier, Westfield, Westmont, White Fence Farms, Whittier Narrows, Willowbrook, Wilsona Gardens, Windsor Hills, Wiseburn, and yes, folks, Wrightwood. Those are the 144 sit unincorporated cities of LA County that now have rent control similar to RSO. Okay, North, North Hills, it was not one of them, North Hills. North Hills, let me look again, LMN, nope, it, for the ends I have N-E-E-N-A-C-H, -E -E don't know how to say that, Newhall and North Whittier. You dodged a bullet. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. No problem. So for all of those cities, you guys now need to register your units on or before the last day of next month. Uh, September 30th, I believe is the deadline. Um, it's $90 for a fully covered unit and $30 for a just cause unit. Ah, I, I don't like all of it, but I know it's coming and we're gonna expect to see more of it before 2025, I expect to see a lot more changes before that. What do you mean by just cause unit? Just cause, meaning uh, you can't, uh, you're just cause for evictions. Does that make sense to you? If your unit is 
um, subject to uh, the Tenant Protection Act, that would make you a just cause unit. Make sense? Yes, yes. Okay, just wanted to make sure you understand the difference between just cause and fully covered. And I don't think they call it fully covered. Let me see what they call it. Hang on. Um, and of course, why is it the one piece of paper you're always looking for is not on top? It's somewhere buried in what you're looking at. There it is. Um, $90 per fully covered unit or space, including mobile home spaces, subject to rent restrictions and protections Example, at fault or no fault eviction reasons. And then $30 per just cause only is subject to just cause eviction protections only. And remember folks, just cause doesn't mean just cause you want to, okay? It's the exact opposite. It means you have to have a cause. You can only evict if you have a cause. Just for a cause is how it should read, but it That's doesn't. Right. That's why they're charging lower. They're giving you a break for just cause unit. Yeah, they're charging you lower because you can't do a whole lot otherwise, you know. <laughs> just cause they want to was my favorite, but that's not how it works. It's the exact opposite. Sorry, I apologize. Someone is trying to call me. <laughs> it happens. Gabby, let's see what you got. I also have a question real quick, Patty. Okay. Is it $30 per unit or $30 per building? $30 per unit. So if you have 500 units, it's going to get expensive quickly. And what's your question, darling? What are the benefits of doing a 11-month lease versus a 12-month lease? Um, honestly? it has the benefit of not paying reloads at 12 months. So in the event they, it's not a good fit and an 11 month lease, you could do a non-renewal and mind you guys, she's in San Bernardino County, okay? Don't panic on my LA County folks and don't listen to this. So when you do an 11 month lease, uh, relocation fees for the TPA kick in at 12 months, it helps you avoid that. And quite frankly, um, and any attorney will tell you this, so listen to them, a lease contract benefits the tenant, not the landlord. Wait, Patty, what'd you say? A lease term benefits the tenant, not the landlord. Because if you forget to put something in that term, can you add it? Can you touch it? Can you change the rules in that 11 months? What if you forgot something? Can't do anything. Your hands are tied as a landlord. The only additional documentation <clears throat> that you can provide to tenants in a lease term is things that are mandated by law. Example, bed bug disclosure, lead-based paint disclosure. Those are things you could give a tenant that's in a term. Other than that, you can't touch them unless they uh, have a material breach of their contract. So evicting for non-payment, yes, you can do that. Um, but uh, month to month is a much better position for the landlord to be in because you can change the rules every month. Make sense? A month to month is much better. And you guys, we don't have the problems that we had years ago where tenants would move in, live there for a couple months and then give us notice and move out. And we were having to flip those vacants and paint and carpet is extremely expensive. So it was very costly to us as landlords to have to flip these vacants every three, two, three months. We don't have that problem anymore. That is not a problem in our industry right now. For the most part, tenants get in and they stay there, okay? So don't let a month-to-month -month contract scare you or intimidate you. It gives you the power to change the rules next month. Oh, you don't like this? Okay, we'll change the rules next month. Here's a 30-day notice to change the terms of tenancy, okay? So a month-to-month -month contract gives the landlord much better position to change the rules in 30 days versus a lease contract where they can't do anything, okay? 
All right, let's get back over to my notes. Did you suggest sending rent increases via certified mail? I'll be sending a few today. Um, law says rent increases need to be sent certified mail and also posted on their door. So when you do a mailing for a rent increase or termination of tenancy, it is required by statute to use certified mail. It is the only time certified mail is required. Rent increases or termination of tenancy. Rent increase only once a year, even if the tenant's on a month to month lease. No, Belsie, no. You can do a rent increase more than once a year if you're governed by how much you can raise the rent. And I'll just throw out last year as an example, if you can only raise 8.6% in a 12 month period, you could do a 4% increase in the beginning of the year and you could do a 4.6% increase in the middle of the year and still be in your 8.6% within a 12 month period. Got it? <laughs> So you can do multiple increases in a year as long as you don't go over the amount that you're governed by. Make sense? I hope it does. I hope it does. And then let me see if we have anything else. What's the difference between a change of terms of tenancy and an addendum? You paying attention? An addendum needs to be signed by all parties. A change in terms of tenancy does not. So if you're trying to change the rules, you don't want them to have to sign and agree to it. You want to dictate what the rule is. You don't need them to sign. You serve them. So that's the difference. Got it? An addendum has to be signed and agreed to by all parties. A 30-day notice to change the terms of tenancy, you as the landlord get to sign it and implement it. You don't need their permission or their consent or whatever you want to call it, okay? I hope that helps. I heard now we can increase rent 10% on all properties, properties regardless if they are protected by the TPA or not. Who asked me that? Belsey? Do you know why? Okay, Belsey, I'm gonna to explain to you why. The Tenant Protection Act says that you can increase rents to the CPI plus 5%, not to exceed 10%. Right now, the CPI is at 7%. So if you take the 7% and add the five, that's 12%, but we max out at 10, right? So that's why they're telling you, regardless if it's governed by the TPA or not, the maximum you can increase this year right now is 10%. That's why they're telling you that, is the Tenant Protection Act caps out at 10%. It will never go over 10% unless they modify the law, okay? Sometimes it helps if we know the answers to the why. I always try to explain the why, you guys, because if you know the why, you won't ask the question again. It, you'll, you, you know the answer. You know why the answer is no or yes or whatever it may be. Is it mandatory to provide initial inspection for move out? Can <laughs> send by mail. Arlene, pay attention, okay? If you notify the tenant of their right to have an initial inspection and you give that paper to them, it's golden when you get to small claims court, okay? That's where it matters. When you get into small claims court and you approach the judge, hello, your honor, I'm here disputing a tenant security deposit. First thing that small claims ask you is did you notify them of their right to have an initial inspection? The answer better be yes. Because if it's no, you have no legal right to make any deductions from their security deposit and your case just got dismissed. The tenant won. You lose, go home. Understand? If you fail to offer them to have the initial inspection, and remember, you don't have to perform the inspection if they don't want it, but you have to offer it. The offer of it is what allows you 
to be able to deduct from their security deposit. If you don't offer that inspection, you can't legally deduct from their security deposit. You will lose in small claims court. Okay, I hope that made sense to you, but it doesn't matter on the disposition and all that, where it matters to you is if you try to sue them later in small claims or if they sue you. You can't legally deduct anything from the tenant security deposit unless you've notified them of their right to have an initial inspection. If you failed to do that, then you will most likely lose in small claims court. Okay. And thank you for asking me these questions because it helps me see that there's all kinds of places I can educate. <laughs> I gotta go backwards, hang on you guys. I hope that answered for you, Arlene. Gabby, I have a tenant in Montebello, LA County that has always paid rent except for August. I gave them a three-day notice and now they've given me a form in writing that they were affected by COVID. No shit. Sorry, this makes me so mad. Can we evict or do we have to wait until the end of the year? Um, try again for September. Because they can self-certify each month going forward. So if they don't pay you September's rent, serve them a three day, see if they self-certify. They can do this up until the end of the year. And I need to check and see if they're going to allow self-certification for tenants through phase three of LA County's moratorium, which begins on January 1st and goes through the end of June of 2023. I haven't read it in detail. I know you guys, I'm sorry. I've been a little busy. <laughs> I will read it in detail and I'll talk to the attorneys about it and see what their mindset is on it. But at this point, they can self-certify for COVID until the end of this year. They have to do it within seven days of the rent being due, or they could do it within seven days of you serving them a three-day notice. So as nice as I could say this to you, this is the game they're playing now, Gabby, and they're adding it to their COVID rental debt. Okay, so game on, serve them a three-day notice on September 2nd if the rent's due on the 1st for September's rent, and let's see if they pay or if they keep playing the game. Okay, and it all goes on their COVID debt. Is there a timeline on the offer of a move out inspection? Absolutely. So the law states that you must notify them um, within two weeks of them vacating, or that's how the document reads. So I always tell them that they need to schedule a pre move out inspection no later than 10 days prior to them vacating. Remember, this initial inspection is for you to go out there and tell them, you gotta put it back the way you found it, move, remove all your personal belongings, but it was originally designed and developed for a tenant that caused damage so that the property manager or the landlord could come out there and tell them what they needed to fix, how they needed to fix it, um, so that they could get their security deposit back. The two weeks gives them two weeks of time to do those repairs or prepare the unit for the move out date. Okay, so I always do no pre-inspections. Um, pre-inspections must be scheduled. Pre-move out inspections must be scheduled at least 10 days prior to move out. And I write that right on the form. Otherwise, they could ask you to do it the day before. And now you're doing two inspections within two days. There's no time for them to fix anything. And it's a waste of your time. Got it? But you still have to go. If they ask for it, you still have to go. So what I put on my documentation is it must be scheduled two weeks prior to their vacate date. We have to offer initial inspection to all tenants. Termination of tenancy, eviction, non-renewal. No, if they are being evicted, you don't notify them. If they are abandoned, you don't notify them. If they are surrender, you don't notify them. Those are the three instances where you do not have to notify them of their right to have an initial inspection. And yes, I will repeat it. Eviction, abandonment, or surrender. 
eviction, abandonment, or surrender are those. You don't have to do a pre-move out inspection. You don't have to even offer it for those three instances. Non-renewal, absolutely. Should I mail and post and send by email as well? Uh, post and mail is considered legal service. Email is just you emailing them a copy. It, the court doesn't recognize it. So I try not to utilize it because the court doesn't recognize it. Uh, please explain how much is a relocation fee in San Bernardino and does it apply to evictions for nuisance payments? Relocation fees in San Bernardino would be under the Tenant Protection Act. That's the TPA or the statewide rent control. It was known as AB 1482. It's now known as California Civil Code 1946.6. The relocation fee is comparable to one month's rent. Got it? I hope that helps. <laughs> Does it apply to evictions or you get some for non-payment or nuisance? Does it apply to those cases? No, if you're doing an eviction, you don't, or for a relocation fee, you don't have to do it for an eviction, a nuisance, non-payment. The relocation fees for statewide rent control come in when you don't have cause. Example, owner wants their property back, has a family member that wants to move in, has to do major renovations. Those would be when you're paying those relocation fees. For Thank the you. act, I hope that makes sense. Yes, David. <laughs> Thank you. And no problem. So, if you're evicting, or there's a nuisance in your evicting, or you're doing non-payment, that you don't have to pay relocations. Even in LA, you shouldn't have to pay relocations if that's your cause of action. Uh, does a text or phone call count, or must it be in writing? Val, everything you do in this industry has to be in writing, with the exception of one thing. You ready for the one thing? The one thing that you absolutely do not have to disclose in writing is the weirdest thing ever. It's whether or not somebody died in the unit in the past three years. You can do that verbally. Everything else has to be in writing. Everything, okay? It's the only thing in this industry that I have found so far that you absolutely positively do not have to put in writing is if somebody died in the unit within the last three years. That is an oral disclosure and needs to be done <clears throat> when they inquire about the unit, when they put in an application, once the application is improved and again it move in. Those are the four times I notify verbally. When they're inquiring about the property, when they turn in an application, when the application is approved, in other words, I tell them at hello and then I keep repeating it to them so they are, it's well known and disclosed. But that is the only thing I've found so far that absolutely positively does not have to be in writing. I don't make the rules, folks. <laughs> okay, let me see what else I got. Uh, can we charge for the initial inspection or is it written somewhere where it read that we cannot? You cannot charge for an initial inspection. I'll tell you this right now and it's getting challenged quite a bit, especially in LA County. You ready? You can't charge the tenant for doing your job, even if it's written in the lease contract. So if you put in the lease contract that you're gonna charge the tenant every time you have to serve a three-day notice, know that that isn't gonna stand up in court. How can you charge a tenant for you doing your job? You can't, it's unethical. So can you charge them if they, if they ask to have an initial inspection? That's your job. You have to go explain to them what they need to do to get their security deposit back. You can't charge them for that, no. There are very few things that you can legally charge a tenant for. Rent, utilities, potentially pet rent. That's about it. 
Patty, for offering pre-inspection, does it have to be in writing or something It is already in the rental agreement? Um, it could be in, it's a pre-written document you can get from your apartment association. Some people pre-write it in their rental agreement to cover their asset. I don't know that that would uphold in court. I'd have to ask an attorney, how can you offer them a pre-move out inspection and then they don't move out for two years? Are you going to remember that? I'm not. So I don't know if that constitutes of giving notice. I would think, and this is just because I, I work in a law firm, you guys, my brain's wired differently now, but I would think when they gave you notice, you would respond with a right to have an initial inspection because that's what I do, okay? If a tenant brings me in a 30-day notice and says they're gonna be moving out, I respond with, thank you so much, your prorated rent will be this amount and we expect you to vacate as per your statement on such and such date, okay? I also send them a right to their pre-move out inspection telling them that they must perform it two weeks prior to them vacating. Okay, so whenever somebody gives me a 30 day notice, I give two notices back. One acknowledges their move out notice and notifies them of the prorated amount. Number two is their right to an initial inspection. And remember, if they don't return it back to you and say that they want it done, you don't have to go do it. Don't go beat on the door. I need to do your pre move out inspection. No, you don't. You're not required to. You're required to offer it. If they want it, then you're required to go do it. But if they don't send you that back saying that they want you to do that, you don't have to. Hit the easy button, it's less work for you. And that piece of paper, you're gonna pull out in small claims court and show the judge, yes, I notified them of their right to have an initial inspection. So if you put it in the lease, could an attorney argue that, hey, your honor, they put it in the lease, it was in the lease contract? Yes, you could argue that. Um, I don't know that it would completely save you though. I don't know. I'd have to ask an attorney and I will do that just for you guys. Okay. Um, I got more properties. Hang on. Gabby, I have a vacant unit in Pomona under the LA County side. Just so everybody knows part of Pomona is in LA County and part of Pomona is in San Bernardino County. So it gets very confusing very quickly. LA County and many people have called with Section 8 and asked if we accept vouchers. I just say they have to meet the criteria. Is there a better way to answer without discriminating? I always say, yes, of course we accept Section 8. Um, all applicants must meet our criteria. So that's just the verbiage I use is, yes, we accept vouchers. We accept how we accept, we accept, we accept, because you guys cannot discriminate or against um, a federally funded program like Section 8 or Veterans, I call it VASH, and it's Veterans Assistant Supplemental Housing. I got it, but I always got to spell that one out. It messes me up, and I, I cater to the VASH because, you know, these people put their lives at risk for us. Uh, okay. Patty, I, I'm just curious, this uh, uh, not accepting Section 8 is a state rule or is a federal rule that applies to other states outside California? Uh, state law. State law specific to California. So some states, uh, if you have building, you can say, no, I'm sorry, I don't accept Section 8. Correct. Thank you. No problem. Most tenants refuse a two week in advance inspection and only allow a day or two before they leave. I have been pretty lenient on that. Is it bad? No, it's just how are they going to do all? Let's say that you show up two days before their move out date and you're like, there's a basketball size hole in the wall. Um, you're going to have to fix that. You need to have the carpets cleaned and you're going to have to have the bathtub resurfaced because it appears you bathed a horse in there and you've just totally destroyed the lining of the bathtub. So you're gonna have to have that resurfaced and refaced. They can't do that in two days. They can't, you can't expect them to do all those repairs in two days. That's why I always push it for two weeks in advance. And that's when the pre-move out is done. 
okay? And I'm very strict on it because how are they going to fix anything else in two weeks? Two weeks is what you're required to give them by law. Stick with it. It works. Does a 30-day email count as move out? I provided the AGLA form. They did not use it. So the tenants emailed you a 30-day notice that they're going to vacate? It could, but it's got to have the property address, the date, and a signature on it to be valid. A court of law is not going to allow you to use an email to evict a tenant by them failing to get out. It's going to have to be a paper in writing. So what I always do is I always tell them, oh, thank you so much for the email, but I do need this in pen and ink with a wet signature. So could you please either email me a copy of this signed or, uh, I'm sorry, could you please print and mail me a copy of this signed and or could you please um, put that in writing with pen and ink and bring it to our office or we have a form for you to fill out for your convenience. But I do need a wet signature is how I explain that. One of the online sites for rentals has section eight as a checkbox, is it best to check it or leave it blank? You can check it because you're accepting section eight. You have to accept it. You cannot discriminate against it. If someone calls and asks if we accept section eight and we say no, is that illegal? Absolutely, absolutely. Anything that's federally funded, you cannot discriminate against the source of income is how they get you, okay? But you cannot discriminate against their source of income. The food, food stamp applies to an income food stamp? Absolutely. Food stamps are a source of income. It's how they pay for groceries. Not all their groceries, but a large portion of them, I'm sure. So when you're accounting someone's funds and they're on assistance or an assistance program, you have to account the funds they get as money coming in and the food stamps coming in as money coming in. That's money. Yes, they must meet. Don't say they must meet our requirements, Val. All tenants must meet your requirements. So all applicants must meet our criteria is the correct verbiage. All applicants must meet our criteria to become a tenant. One more time, just because I know somebody's trying to write that down. All applicants must meet our criteria to become residents. And I'm sorry, you guys, I know I'm really good with verbiage. I have been forever really good with verbiage. I don't know why. I also have somewhat of a photographic memory, but not like you would think, <laughs> not like you would want it to. Like I can see a piece of paper in my head if I've looked at it or I've touched it. I can see it. I could tell you what color the ink is. I can't read the words on it, but I remember which house it's associated with. It's really weird. Don't ask. I, it's hard for me to even explain to you right now, let alone my coworkers that all think I'm some creepy weirdo because I can tell them, oh, look for it. it it's in there. I saw it. It's, it's in pink writing. I can tell them what color ink is used on the front of it. It's really weird. Hey, Patty, I have a tenant who we've served uh, N -N uh, NTT, notice to terminate for those of you that aren't savvy with all of our little acronyms. They are supposed to turn in keys on the 1st of September. The tenant asked for an extension and the owner declined. If he does not turn in keys, can the owner begin eviction? Absolutely. They failed to vacate as requested. Okay. Um, and in the event you're ever going to do an extension, you guys, let me give you a tip real quick. Okay. <laughs> real quick. Um, if you're going to do an extension, don't take any rent. You're welcome. Just don't take any rent. 
If you're gonna extend it for a week and give them one more week, just don't charge them for rent for that one week. Because the second you take a penny over that 60 day notice, you void the notice and you have to reserve, okay? Can you write a bunch of paperwork and re-sign an addendum and blah, blah, blah? Yeah, but when you get down to the brass tax, if you took rent past the expiration of that notice, you voided it, hands down. So if you want to do it the easy, less contested, nobody can argue it kind of way, is don't take any rent for those two weeks. And start the eviction in two weeks in one day. Because you didn't accept any rent, your notice is still valid. But if you accepted additional rents, you voided your 60 day. I hope everybody understands that. Or your 30 day, depending on what it was. So if you're gonna extend it a week and help them out, take, the, take that week of rent out of their security deposit, but don't take the rent for that week or you void your notice. I don't care what you put in writing. It's up for a judge to determine. And I've always seen that go pretty badly. So just don't take rent. Can I have an additional week? I'll pay you for it. Oh, no problem. We'll go ahead and do that. And you can either give me a check when you move out for the rent that's owed, or I'll take it from your deposit. I don't automatically um, wanna tell them that I'll take it from their deposit because then they'll stay 30 days thinking they're spending their deposit. You know what I mean? So I don't like to say, I don't like to volunteer the information that I will remove it from their security deposit because then they get the idea that they can stay instead of the one week they asked for two weeks or maybe three, or oh, oh, now it won't be ready until next month. But remember, if you take rent money, you void your 60 day or your 30 day. So if you can avoid taking the rent based on how you're working that, it's a better choice. What if they don't have good credit? Who, the person on section eight, Gabby? If they don't meet your criteria, then you don't accept that applicant. Yes, sorry, I didn't specify. Um, it's just I've had a lot of people call me right off the bat. Do you accept Section 8? Like, that's the first question. And, <laughs> and I don't, sometimes they can me off guard. Must, so I tell them. Absolutely, you must meet our criteria. What is your criteria? We require a 650 FICO score, no evictions. Uh, you must make three times the amount of your portion of the rent. If they notify you that they're section eight right out of the gate, remember that you're three times the amount of the rent or you're two and a half times the amount of the rent is on their portion, not on the total amount. Okay, thank you. Just trying to keep that in your head. So if they're specifically asking about section eight, and I love this because I saw a section eight paper, somebody sent it to me and their tenant gave it to them and said, watch out if your landlord's doing any of this, it's illegal. And it says not accepting section eight. It says requiring that you make two to three times the amount of the full rent. And somebody called me out on that and said, hey, Patty, this paperwork came from section eight and says that we can't, we can't do that. You're right. You can't tell them that they can make three times the amount of the full rent, but you can ask that they make three times the amount of their portion. So if their portion is 12 bucks a month and they don't have a job, how are they making three times the amount of their portion? They're not income qualified. See how that worked? <laughs> okay. Just trying to give you guys some tools to use. And remember those words that come out of your mouth they matter. So if they're telling you right at hello, do you accept section eight? Yes, we do. You need to make three times the amount of your portion, not the full amount of the rent, only their portion, okay? Don't mess that up. <laughs> if you need more help, let me know. I'm here to help you. All right, does anybody have anything else? We're coming up on the hour, so I'm just trying to make sure I get to everybody's questions. And I do have a couple of announcements. It's not major. Here we go, Anna's asking me something. Thank you, you guys. I couldn't do this without you guys. That's what you don't realize. 
What about security deposits from Section 8 applicants? If on Section 8 or not, and I want two months security deposit, how much does the Section, app, Section 8 applicant pay? Two months, the amount of the deposit or the amount of the rent. In other words, what I'm very simply trying to say to you is that there is no restrictions on requirements for security deposits when dealing with Section 8, BASH, or any other federally funded program. Got it? Sometimes Section 8 pays the deposit amount. Sometimes they require the tenant to. The biggest problem with Section 8, in my opinion, and mind you, Section 8 payments were made throughout the entire pandemic period without hesitation. So it does have some benefits. And that was a good one, right? You guys paying attention? Section 8 got paid throughout the entire pandemic. They may not have paid their portion, but Section 8 usually pays the larger portion anyway. Um, just saying. Hang on, I saw some other stuff come through. So when it comes to security deposits, you can still ask for two times the amount of the deposit or three times the amount of the deposit, whatever your criteria is. Um, and that's what they have to pay. There's no restriction on Section 8 deposit amounts. They may argue with you. They may ask you to take less. They may try to convince you to take less or to lower the rent. And the response should be, I'm sorry. That's what I'm asking for. I understand that you're not willing to pay that. Then I'll take another applicant. Got it? Okay. I've been researching cost segregation, which is something everyone should look into unless you plan to sell in the next few years. Bonus depreciation ends this year, so get your CPA on it. Yep, pay attention, you guys. We're gonna see some major shifting, not only in the sales market, the real estate market, in the economy. In our 401ks, we're gonna see some major, major shifting in the near future as they veer away from FICO scores and implement the new system. Wait, what did Patty just say? That's right. They're doing away with FICO scores, folks. And the new system sucks. I know I have a friend that works at a very important agency and is connected with the government and is actually working on our new system. And this person that I know that tells me about these things is extremely scared of what the future looks like. And I'll leave my statement at that. But yes, they are gearing away from FICO and moving to a different type of system. They're doing quite a few interesting things. What it looks like for who? For us, us humans. They, the government, are trying to do away with our FICO credit scoring system and they're gonna implement a new different system. I have a friend that works on the company that's creating the technology. Yuck, I know. And now everybody's just quiet and going, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know. I try not to throw too much at you guys because I don't know how much of it's actually going to go through, how much of it's going to stick, but there's changes coming. Trust and believe that. There are changes coming. And for the most part, I don't like them. And mind you, I'm not talking about in our residential houses. I'm talking as Americans. It's the new system Biden keeps talking about. I never posted a rent increase. Is that really the law? Bummer if so, nobody likes to post. Uh, personal service works. <laughs> the reset, Melanie, yes. 
a lot of things are going to be done away with. FICO score is one of them. I have a feeling they're also going to change our money. Yeah. Uh, um, I believe if you look in your records, Val, you posted and mailed because that's the requirement of proper service. Either that or personally hand it to them. Also, proper service. I'm trying now. <laughs> and you guys, please pay attention. If I ever tell you, look in your file, I'm sure you might find. I'm trying to tell you, you should have done that. <laughs> For a rent increase, uh, post mail certified or personal service or subservice. Remember, there's only three ways to serve a document. Personal service, subservice, or post and mail. So if you're sending certified, I'm gonna assume you posted. And darn that wind, it blows like crazy in some of those towns. Being funny, you guys. Only it sucks because I can't hear any of you laughing. <laughs> All right, lots of wind. Yes, and remember I live in the desert. It's very windy there. Um, upcoming things that we need to talk about. Uh, what are we looking in? We're looking in September. We got some things going on in September. If you're in an unincorporated city of LA County, you have till the end of the month to register all of your units. They count them by doors. So it's not one apartment that you're registering, it's how many units in the apartment you are registering. So it's gonna get expensive, um, but we need to do that by the end of next month, um, September. Uh, I don't think I have any weird things going on with you guys as far as our Wednesday meetings, we should be spot on. It's the first part of October that we're gonna have some weird ones. Um, the very first one, I don't, uh, very first meeting of October, I don't anticipate any hiccups at all whatsoever. The second meeting in the month of October is a problem. I will be flying that day. And the next day, I think I'm at a trade show. So as we get closer to that one, I'll um, give you guys a heads up, let you know what we're going to do. Maybe we'll go back to um, the 911 Memorial Park in Philadelphia. That went over pretty good. So we'll do something fun, okay? We'll go somewhere exciting, folks. Um, I just might have to change the date on one of our October meetings. All right, if nobody has anything else, I'm gonna end the meeting for today. Of course, thank you guys. You guys are my heroes and you don't even know it. Without you, I wouldn't be able to do this. And that matters to me, so. Let's keep doing it, folks. <laughs> Let's stay on all this new stuff together and we'll work together as a team. All right, if nobody has anything else, have a great week. Yes, and stay cool, it's hot out there. Um, and you guys know how to find me if you need me. Uh, for my Roadrunner folks, I got your information on 627. I'll go implement that with accounting and then we'll reach back out to you, okay? Bye everybody, have a great week.